It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. It's not every day that a scholar publishes a book that changes the entire landscape of a field of study, but that's exactly what Robert Alter did in 1981 with his book, The Art of Biblical Narrative. For centuries and more, scholars had meticulously studied the biblical text to tease out the voices of those who compiled it. But Robert Alter paid attention to the finished product to see what the stories had to say. It's hard to overestimate Alter's influence on literary studies of the Bible, looking at plot, genre, character, and more. Alter recently finished his own complete translation of the Hebrew Bible, a mammoth task that took quarter of a century. In this episode, Robert Alter joins us to talk about the challenges and surprises of biblical translation. He visited the Maxwell Institute earlier this year to deliver a set of guest lectures, which you can find right now on our YouTube channel. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. Robert Alter joins us here at the Maxwell Institute. Thank you for doing the interview. We're glad I'm to have you. Happy to do it. Let's start off here. The first English Bible translation was done by William Tyndale in the 1520s, and he did the New Testament, but only some of what Christians right. call the Old Testament. And it's been centuries since his book appeared. But did you feel any kinship with him as a translator? Well, yes. Uh, well, first of all, he wasn't the committee. <laughs> yeah. And. The vast majority of translations that, that have been done have been by committee. I think, by and large, to their detriment, because committees come up with consensuses, and uh, they're usually compromises and probably reflect the lowest common denominator. And I'm thinking on a level of style rather than uh, philological choices. The King James Version did pretty well as a committee. Uh, I think because this was a moment in English literary history when the learned divines who had been assembled by King James I, who, and they were m men who, of course, knew biblical Hebrew with errors, but they knew biblical Hebrew, they knew Aramaic, some of them knew Syriac, of course they knew Greek and Latin, some of them knew Arabic, but they were also steeped in the literary culture of their times. You know, Lancet Andrews, the leading figure among the 40 Samad translators, was a fine English stylist, as we know from his published sermons. The opposite has been true for a long time. You go to Johns Hopkins or Yale, Harvard, Penn, Oxford, Cambridge, and learn all kinds of useful things about the Bible, but you're not looking at style. And these people, I think, demonstrably, are not reading W.S. Merwin or, or Ian McEwen. You compared it to even more like kind of a boring newspaper article right, voice right. That, that they had. Exactly. Now, to go back to your question about Tyndall, I think he was a kind of untutored genius. That is, he had this notion that there was some profound affinity between the Hebrew language and the English language, which I think is probably not true, but for him it was kind of an enabling fiction. And he thought that he could render the Bible in an English that would be accessible to an ordinary plowboy. And that was a, a guiding principle that helped him to keep it simple, because poetry is a different story. In the, the narrative prose in the Hebrew Bible, there is a concerted effort to use primary vocabulary, to keep things simple, and to produce subtle effects through repetition of the same words rather than through elaborate synonyms. That's the way in which I do feel an affinity with, with Tyndall. At the same time, I'm grateful for the fact that translators of the Bible these days are not usually burned at the stake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is. That's a good thing about living in your era. Speaking of the King James, that's not the first way you encountered the Hebrew Bible, right? Oh, no. Uh, the, the first way I encountered the Hebrew Bible was in Hebrew. You have a Jewish background. Yeah, right? I have a Jewish yeah. background. Sort of, I would say, 
traditional but not orthodox. Now, we, we were not the kind of family, I don't know that many Jewish families are, where the family would sit around and read the Bible out loud. So I didn't have much exposure to the Bible as a kid, except I confess maybe when I was about 10 to comic book version of some <laughs> of the, the, the Bible stories. So when I first started getting into the Bible was when I was in my teens, probably it was by my late teens, when I was able to read it in Hebrew and I, I was drawn into it. And then when you first encountered the King James, did you see pretty big differences in how oh, you yeah, experienced yeah. it? I mean, let me say this about the King James. It's certainly grand, and I would take it in a heartbeat over any of the modern translations which I think, let's say just in terms of felicitous English, are wretched compared to the King James. There are some problems with the King James. I'll kind of put aside the errors in construing the Hebrew. The fact is that we have a better knowledge now of biblical Hebrew than Christian Hebreus did in the 17th century. And the Christian Hebrews, to be, to be honest, were, were never quite as good with their Hebrew as Hebrew Hebrews, the uh, Jewish Hebrews. Uh, some of the great medieval Hebrew commentators are quite wonderful, have a subtle sense of what's going on in the, the Hebrew. Okay, so put aside the errors. Certainly put aside the archaic language. It's in their, their fault and that, thousands. like any language, English <laughs> yeah. is changed a lot since 1611. On the whole, they do well with the prose narrative, especially because they're rather literal and they follow the syntactic contours of the Hebrew, which the moderns don't do. One example, that's parataxis, which yeah, right, you exactly. do as well. Maybe exactly. take a second to describe that phenomenon. Well, biblical prose unfolds through parallel clauses connected by and, and that is technically called parataxis, which really means parallel syntax. So instead of a period or something, it'd be like da-da-da-da-da, and da-da-da-da-da, and da-da-da-da-da. Well, it's not only the lack of a period, it's the lack of a although, in as much as, therefore, because, yeah. since, therefore. It's just and. Now, uh, the modern committees view this as something we can't assimilate anymore. And uh, so they repackage the syntax. Now, that, I think, is a grave error because the parallel syntax is a manifest artistic resource for the biblical writers. That is, in some cases, say, Rebecca at the Well, it gives you a sense of a rush of events, one after the other, and she did this, and, and, and. Yeah, she's filling up the water to, to give to the camels, right. and it's this huge feat of miraculous strength, be, but that can get lost in the translation. Right, right. And then there's a kind of dignity and high decorous quality as in the first creation narrative story and so forth. So it would be, I think it's a great loss not to uh, preserve it. And let me tell you a little story. I have a friend who teaches at Stanford, and a couple of years ago, before my three volumes came out, he was teaching a course for undergraduates at Stanford in, in which he was including parts of the book of Ezekiel. And he said, could you, if you have it in draft, could you show me some such and such chapters in Ezekiel, which I'd like to share with my students. So I said, sure. <laughs> so I, I sent it to him, and he gave it to his students, and they were reading another translation, probably the New Revised Standard Version. And then he gave them this interesting assignment. He asked them to compare my translation with the other one they had been reading. And almost every one of them said what they really liked about my translation in comparison w with the other one by a modern committee is that 
it preserved the parataxis because for them, it made things more concrete, it, it was more eloquent, and so forth. And, and that was an eye-opener for me because uh, the assumption of the moderns has been that modern readers cannot in any more assimilate parataxis. And here are these 19-year-olds at Stanford who are really responding to it. Yeah, the text seems to flow. I'll, I'll read here. This is from Genesis chapter 1. The very first verse sure. has this example of parataxis. And there's also another element here that I want to ask you about. So here it is, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. When God began to create heaven and earth, and the earth then was welter and waste and darkness over the deep, and God's breath hovering over the waters, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And then it continues right. on. So we have a lot of these ands, but it keeps the story moving. It keeps, right. it's very moving. The other thing is very interesting phrasing here when you said the earth was welter and waste. Talk about that because I think it highlights kind of a lot of what you're trying to do when you translate. Yeah, that's true. I came to the first verse, uh, you know, I didn't quite know yet what I was doing <laughs> as a Bible translator, the very first verse I translated. <laughs> and I knew, of course, that the Hebrew was tohu vavohu. Now, it's that's, got a nice ring to it. Yeah, that is generally represented first in the King James and by the moderns with modest variations as something like chaos and void. Or like without form and yeah, void or, or, or something. Formlessness yeah, formlessness and, yeah. and void. Now, that's perfectly okay as far as the sense of the Hebrew phrase. The thing is, works of literature, especially great works of literature, are not limited in the meanings they convey to lexical values of words. So if you think you've nailed it by getting the lexical value, you may be dead wrong. So I said to myself, tohu vavohu, I can I wish I could think of a rhyming pair, but I can't. So instead, I'll use a strong alliteration and call it welter and waste. And then, uh, not at the time, but uh, rather later, I thought about this. And English has a number of pairs like this, like harem scarum, mm -hmm. helter skelter. Mm -hmm. And all these pairings actually suggests, be, because of the phonetic interaction of the two words that are bracketed, they suggest things mixed together in some hasty lack of order. And that's perfect for Genesis. So at least with alliteration, I felt that I needed to do something like that. Yeah, and you do that throughout the translation. You say that the Bible contains an artfulness that the translations usually fail to convey, and that the artfulness itself is part of the text. It's part of what the Bible is trying to do. Here's a, a quote from you. You say that style is the vital medium through which the biblical vision of God, humans, and everything else is communicated. Right. Yeah. yeah, I stand by that. We're talking today with Robert Alter. He's a professor of Hebrew and comparative literature at the University of California, Berkeley. He recently published his complete translation of the Hebrew Bible, and his latest book is called The Art of Bible Translation. So, Robert, you've said that the practice of translation you learned from experience is an endless series of compromises, and some of those are happy and some of those are painful. Talk about a painful one. Where did you have to make a painful compromise as you translated? Okay, let me just explain what was behind that, that remark. If you're translating the Bible or you're translating, let's say, Pindar or Virgil or uh, Flaubert, you're translating writers who make the most subtle and inventive and sometimes surprising use of the intrinsic resources of expression of their language. And since your language is not the same as theirs, you're often going to find that you're very hard put to find even an approximate equivalent. And so you had to settle for something less. 
My general guiding principle is that I try to be literal, but if it sounds weird or ridiculous <laughs> in English, I have to forget about the literalness. So that's one kind of comrade. So let me tell you a place where I was literal. The result is a little bit awkward, but I decided it was worth paying the price of awkwardness. This is a painful trans <laughs> a compromise. Everybody talks about Adam and Eve. In fact, the, the figure that we represent as Adam is always called an article in uh, Hebrew with a definite article, the Adam, meaning it's a common noun. It's not a proper noun. And an Adam is a person or a human being. And in fact, although grammatically all, all uh, Hebrew nouns are either masculine or feminine. There's no way of getting a, a, a away from it. It's gendered through and through. However, although it's grammatically masculine, it's not inflected as to gender. How do I know that? The verse in uh, Genesis 1, in the image of God, he created them. He created the Adam, male and female, he created them. So the Adam includes female. So even though I have sympathy with, with, with feminism, it wasn't feminist principle, but rather what the language itself says that led me to avoid translating Adam as man. Well, I'm, there's an exception I'll come to in a minute. So what did I do? I translated Adam, Ha-Adam, the Adam, as the human. That's a little bit clunky. And, you know, God created the human. It's, it's a bit like I said to myself afterwards, like a sci-fi story. Yeah. With somebody from another galaxy can say, oh, yeah, there's the human. Because we bring this different cultural background and baggage to that word, right? right so it right. does sound like an extraterrestrial <laughs> yeah. or something. So that was kind of an awkward compromise. But for the reason that I just spelled out, I couldn't bear either to represent it as a proper name, Adam, because that's just wrong, or to represent it as gendered when it's male and female he created. So I settled for, for this awkward compromise. Now, let me give a counterexample where I decided not to use the, the compromise. You have in Psalms and a few other places, in my translation, man and beast the Lord rescues. As the Hebrew sounds like this, Adam uvehema Yeshia Adonai. Now, I felt that man and beast, and it comes up a few other times, as paired terms, is so proverbial in English that it's perverse not to keep it, even though I regret the gendered aspect of man. I mean, in other places, I do use, if the writer seems to be referring to people in general, I'll use humankind, not mankind. Hmm. That suggests, too, that your translation also has a shelf life, right? Then because... English language is going to continue to adjust, and so... Well, sure, e every translation does. Yeah, have you thought about that as you did the work in terms of the sh a shelf life? That's a good question. Yeah, I translated it in order to provide the best English rendering that seemed to convey the, the values of the Hebrew that I could in the English as we use it at this point in time. So I, I didn't deliberately translate in a way to say, well, if I use these words, it'll have a shelf life uh, of 110 years <laughs> instead of a shelf life uh, of 10 years, okay? However, let me tell you something that I did do which might extend the, the shelf life. It seemed to me a grave mistake among many that the modern versions make to translate the Bible, which is after all written, let's say, beginning in Iron Age 2, in a different part of the world, 
to translate it as though it were written in contemporary English. So while I avoided blatant archaisms, which would sound altogether too coy or cute or whatever, or affected, I did scrupulously avoid all terms that sounded explicitly contemporary. Okay, I'll give you an example. I hope that th this is not for indelicate ears. <laughs> well, we can always edit it out. So, you know. yeah, right. uh, okay, now, the Hebrew Bible, which is very frank about the body, unlike the moderns who seem uneasy about the body, especially the female body, uh, and fudge a lot of the term, there are basically three words for having sex. There's to lie with, which you all understand, and that's what the King James Version uses. And uh, I don't think there's any problem of comprehensibility, even if it's not contemporary. That is, someone wouldn't say to his best friend after a date, did you lie with her last night, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, it's funny. We wouldn't use it in normal yeah, right, talk, right. but most people know what that would mean, yeah. Yeah, okay. So there's to lie with. There's to to know. Now, to know, I think, has established itself in English because of the literal rendering of the King James Version. And we even have a legal term, carnal knowledge. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows what that is. And it's kind of a joke you'll hear people say, like, yeah. know in a biblical sense. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. People say that all the time. Yeah. So that means they know the biblical sense. Yes. And the... Third example, this is a slightly tricky one to translate, is literally to, to come into. Now, I decided to modify that for a simple, you know, have all these calculations in translation. Yeah. I, I figured to come into might suggest to some people simply the act of penetration. Right. And it's androcentric. Yeah. yeah. And it's androcentric. Whereas the come into in biblical Hebrew has a sense of a consummated sexual relationship. And usually, actually, it's used for the first time you have sexual relations with, with a woman. So I ended up with, I wanted to preserve the come to bed with. It's a bit of a compromise, but, yeah. I, but I think it worked. Now, and you wanted to avoid the word sex. Would that just be too blatant? To yeah. So, well, here's the thing. When I look at, at the range of modern translations and how they represent the act of sex, here's what I discover. I discover to be intimate with, mm -hmm. to have relations with, to cohabit with, all of which kind of sound legal and ponderous and very 20th, 21st century. And then there's even a mistake in a different direction. One translation, of, a prominent translation, says, uses make love. Hmm. Now, for example, in the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, where she says to him, lie with me, the translation has her saying, make love to me. Now, as, as I said in my little translation book, that makes her sound a little bit like a frustrated wife or a, a neglected mistress. Or a romancer, like she wants some sort of romance or, or something. Or a romancer yeah. saying, make love to me. Yeah. So it, it's just all, it, it's very much of our moment and yeah. not of the biblical moment. So to take all this back to your question about shelf life, I would say that simply hewing to those three biblical terms, two of them quite literally, and the third one with a, a certain modification, I've used language that is a little bit more timeless. Hmm. I mean, if lie with as a biblical locution for sex has survived the 400 years since the King James Version may be around for a while more. Yeah, did you find yourself seeing the King James that way? I was really interested to see. You had some really good things to say about the King James, and, and we kind of covered that already. It reminds me of something that a famous literary critic said about your translation in, in a review. They said that it productively estranges readers from the text, mm -hmm. and he meant that as a compliment. What did you take away from that? Yeah, <laughs> I have to say that 
a number of years ago, I gave a, a talk of all places at the law school at NYU, and I was introduced by a very fine scholar who's a, a professor there half the year and the other half in Jerusalem named Moshe Halbertal, who is a very learned person, knows Hebrew sources inside out, and uh, grew up in, in an Orthodox background. So this is maybe my, my favorite introduction. He said, you know, I grew up reading the Bible in Hebrew and thought I knew it backwards and forwards. And then when I read Robert Alter on the Bible, I suddenly realized that it was a different book from the one that I imagined. <laughs> and I was very pleased with it. Because I would have to say this, that my great discovery, first as a literary critic, before I was a, a translator, when I wrote a book on biblical narrative, was that, okay, I've always admired the, these narratives, but in fact, when you look at them really closely and try to figure out how they're put together, you see that they manifest a level of literary sophistication, which is astounding. The, the great prose modernists of our era don't in any way eclipse them. Some of them do homages. You got Hemingway and I think uh, even Cormac McCarthy. And that's some of true. These. Yeah. So that, that was kind of a revelation to me about how remarkable it was in, in the way it's wrought. And so then I tried to get that across in translation, and uh, that may be a good reason why it, it seems like a surprising book to, to s some readers. I could give one example, which is dialogue. Now, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just do this in a generalized way. All the translations of, of biblical dialogue which is the heart of biblical narrative. People may not realize this, but the real burden of storytelling is carried on by dialogue. Uh, that is when there's a lot of summary, like the childhood of Jacob or Moses is told in six words, <laughs> and they're growing up. But then when something important is happening, the narrative slows down, so you have an equivalent of narrating time and narrated time, which is what dialogue is. And the dialogues are, in a way, remarkable precursors to dialogue in the novel, which means, among several other things, this, by the way, is something that another surprise for me when I started working on all this. It, what it means is that language is bent and reshaped and sometimes deliberately twisted in order to reflect the character, the social location, the psychology of the speaker and the speaker's interaction with the other speaker. Now, in some cases, the, the language is actually deformed, scrambled. You never see this in the previous translations. Because their assumption is, hey, it's the Bible. It must be coherent. This is the book that's telling us the truth about everything. But in fact, the biblical writers did not hesitate to uh, a character was, uh, let us say, jabbering because he was nervous or didn't know what to say. They represent the jabbering in the Hebrew, which becomes the kind of gibberish that you have to translate as gibberish. Yeah, like someone saying, I don't, what, I, I can't, exactly, she... Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But then some of these, in, in your book, The Art of Bible Translation, if people pick that up, they'll see examples of that yeah, dialogue right. where, you know, you might refer to it as like the myth of coherence, this idea that all these sentences have to make sense, yeah. but you find examples where they don't. And... I wanted to ask, when you started out on this, it began with Genesis. You were invited to do a book on Genesis. That's how this all began. And people that want to know the background of this can check out the lecture that uh, Robert gave here at BYU. The video will be up on our YouTube channel. But when you started that out, did you begin with fear and trembling? Did you begin with doubts? Did you have any, you know, this is the Bible. This is 
probably the most published and published about book in history. Yeah, certainly with doubts. In the following way, what I wanted to do from the get-go was to create an English version of the Bible that would convey much more of the power and subtlety and inventiveness of the Hebrew. But I thought when I began, uh, this maybe this isn't going to work at all. And mm. the reason that I thought it might not work was it's not like translating a French novel. The structure of the two languages is quite different. Even the verb tenses, which means the, the way the time is construed, is quite different in the Bible. And then, since cultures are different, there are many uh, key terms in the Bible that have only very rough equivalents in English, or need several different equivalents in, in, in English. So, my suspicion was, I viewed it as an experiment, especially since I wasn't thinking of doing anything but Genesis at the time. I said, I'll try to do this, but it might turn out to be something of a disaster. That is, people will hate it, <laughs> and I will hate it. Now, it certainly isn't perfect, and no translation ever is perfect, but it turned out to be a better approximation of my dream of translation than I thought I could do. And, uh, and it was very well received, so that's what encouraged me to do more books. Also, what I would say is this. When you're translating a, a text that is culturally and historically and linguistically strange to us, you struggle with how to find a rough equivalent stylistically in English. And if you're lucky, at a certain point, you hit your stride and you begin to say to yourself, I know how to do this. That is, mm. not in specific instances. You may be sailing along <laughs> and then you come on this phrase, oh my God, what am I going to do with it? <laughs> And your translations, uh, they came out in individual volumes first. Um, Genesis right. came out and then some more until you ended up doing the entire Hebrew Bible. And your translations, as they've continued to come out, have been praised and welcomed by uh, believing Jews and Christians mm -hmm. and, and even you know secular-minded people, people uh, who don't adhere to any religious right. tradition. So you're, you're covering a wide range of readership. Did the weight of religious traditions bear on you as you translated, or or the expectations of the academy, or was it just a more straightforward process and you didn't have to really worry about the audience that you were writing it for? Okay, well, there are two questions. One is a religious tradition in the academy, the other is audience. Now, the audience, I didn't have a clear-cut notion to begin with what audience I was aiming at. Since I'm a literary person, and I was very much focused on doing some justice to the literary means of the Bible, I thought the first audience I thought of was people who wanted a heightened appreciation of the, the literary mastery of the Bible, which would have been not necessarily religious people, probably many, many of them secular, people in universities, people teaching courses to undergraduates on the Bible as literature. And in fact, I, I know my genesis is very broadly used. Yep, that's where I first was introduced yeah. to it. Yeah. So that was my first idea from the email response that I've gotten over the years, but especially since the big fat volumes came out. I learned that, that my translation has spoken to people of faith commitments, very different kinds of faith commitments, modern Orthodox Jews, Catholics, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Methodists. This has surprised me. Yeah. Oh. So you didn't see that coming? Yeah, I didn't see that coming. Why do you think that is? What do you, th what do you make of that, uh, that kind of reception? I think that there are lots of people out there with serious religious commitments who have felt that 
the Hebrew Bible they've been reading in some fundamental way doesn't do justice to the original. Either it's denatured, it's not getting the power and the frankness of the original, or uh, even if they're Christians, that it's excessively Christianized. So I've been very pleased, say, to get an email from a Methodist minister who says, I will now use your Bible in my sermons, or from an Episcopalian nun. I didn't quite realize that the, the Episcopalians <laughs> had nuns, but evidently they do, who said that, that my Psalms had changed her religion, her spiritual practice. Mm. Maybe that takes me back to the first part of your, your question, which is, did I feel imposed on by religious tradition when I set out to, to do this? I think not, even though I, I certainly have had some involvement in, in Jewish uh, tradition. Now, the reason is this. Just as modern scholars, quite rightly, have tried to get the exact original meanings uh, of biblical terms, so say a term that is conventionally translated as brook, they determine convincingly meant a wadi, which is a little different from a brook. Okay, that's good. But they haven't taken this project over to the, the terms for spirituality in the Bible. And in trying to be faithful to the original, I, in a way, swept aside the way both Christians and Jews have thought about the Bible. So, biblical spirituality is anchored in the body. This is encouraged by the fact that there's no biblical notion of an afterlife. When you die, you go down into the ground and into a place called Sheol, and that's pretty much it. One biblical scholar, very good biblical scholar in England, at Oxford, John Barton, in a, in a recent book, has said something that always occurred to me, that death in the Bible is rather like death in Homer. Now, in being anchored in the body, I, I discovered that the, there were all sor sorts of biblical terms, or a number of key biblical, biblical terms, that address the realm of the spirit, but they're embodied. Uh, okay, here's one. A central one, which I've talked about in print, if I, I've felt compelled to talk about. There's no soul anywhere in my Bible. Uh, there's no soul because there's no biblical conception of, of soul. There's no notion of, of a dichotomy between body and soul. And especially since there's no afterlife, there's no place that a soul goes to w when the body perishes. So the Hebrew word nefesh, the primary meaning is breath. So it means life breath, and uh, in some contexts is simply life, that is the life of a person, not life in general. But then it has some surprising additional meanings. Because metonymy, this two terms connected because they're in contiguous to each other, it sometimes means throat or neck because that's the passageway for the life breath. It also can mean, strangely enough, appetite. So I'll begin with, with I'll, I'll offer two examples. One that, that the moderns get right and the King James was hilariously wrong on. In uh, one of the Psalms, the speaker says, waters, in the King James Version, waters have come in even unto my soul. So I think there's a, what kind of leaky plumbing is that? <laughs> now, what it actually says, since drowning is an image for death that recurs in Psalms, is that the waters have come up to my neck. You know, another moment and I'm going to drown. Right? So that, that's kind of clear cut and pretty much all the moderns recognize this. But... Here's a, a, another one, an example I used last night in our lecture. In Psalm, I think it's 69, I sometimes get the numbers off, you have, my nephesh thirsts after you, 
as in a parched land without water. Now, most translations render quite eloquently, my soul thirsts after you. Well, I had to resist soul because, as I said, it never really means soul. It does, by the way, in post-biblical Hebrew. But then I looked at the context, parched land without water, and the, the following parallel line where you, you have the word body parallel to uh, nefesh. And I said, it, it has to mean throat. And I translated, perhaps a little shockingly, certainly uh, ignoring tradition, my soul, my th throat thirsts for you. Now, th th that's, as I say, startling, but I think that it's a powerful expression of a spirituality that is a bit different from the spirituality we're accustomed to. In, in other words, the, the speaker wants to express how desperate he is to be in contact, close contact with God. And the, the way he says is, imagine a, go, a guy wandering in the desert. He has, there's no water left in his water skin, and he feels absolutely desperate. His throat is parched and dry and desperate for even a drop of water. My throat thirsts for you as in a, a parched land without water. This is strong. And speaking of the Psalms, I, I imagine that was pretty enjoyable it um, was. To, to do that. But you've done the entire Hebrew Bible. Were there any portions where it was a little bit more difficult to get the motivation to do it? I mean, yeah, well, I can't imagine Chronicles. Or, yeah, Cr you know, Chronicles, or which I, I followed in my, my last push, the order of the Hebrew books. So uh, in, in the Jewish canon, so Chronicles is the very last thing, yeah. and it's a downer. Let's face it, <laughs> that, for a couple of reasons. First, the initial nine chapters of Chronicles 1, I'm not exaggerating, is nothing but lists of names. And That's pretty easy. Yeah. Well, it's easy, but it's a bore. You know, <laughs> what do you do as a translator with lists of names? In addition to which, th there's always this challenge. Uh, I, I decided not to do my own new transliteration uh, mm -hmm. of biblical name. So then you have to try to keep all the spellings exactly mm -hmm. in order. My, my my copy editor had many uh, headaches with that one. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that was one. The other thing that's a downer about Chronicles is that it's a drastic abbreviation and rewrite of the narratives, especially in First and Second Samuel and Kings. And what it does is boulderize them and take all the interesting stuff out. For example, it wants to represent David as an ideal king. So no sex with Bathsheba, no murder of Uriah. The, the things that make this a deeply interesting story are not there. So that, that was a downer. I would say the same for much of Leviticus, mm. because... Legal codes aren't the, your favorite Legal thing. codes, and especially, there are an awful lot of passages describing how you butcher the, the animal sacrifice. I don't even like to walk around in butcher shops. So. <laughs> <laughs> how about a favorite moment of discovery? Were you ever, did you ever find yourself just in awe of something as you went along? You found yourself delighted by something that you translated. Yeah, quite a few things. There were, there were a lot of such discoveries in the book of Job. For example, in the speech from the whirlwind, when God finally talks at, at the end of Job, which I think is one of the greatest poems written in all of antiquity anywhere, he's describing creation. And he says something like the primordial waters with mist their swaddling cloth. Now, swaddling cloth is a kind of ancient equivalent of diapers. So at first I asked myself, what the hell are diapers doing in a creation <laughs> story, right? 
But Joe Poet is certainly the most inventive coiner of metaphors in the Bible. And what he's imagining is like strips of white mist hovering over the surface of the Mediterranean as you look out. And they're like the bands of white cloth, of swaddling cloth. But then why swaddling cloth? It's not always a vivid image, but it hooks up with a whole set of birth images in the first part of the voice from the whirlwind. Mm. And the birth images are a point-for-point point rejoinder to Job's death wish poem in chapter 3, where he wishes he were stillborn. He wishes he had never been conceived. He wishes he had died from the womb. So th mm. this is... A, an amazing poetic reversal. Yeah, I, I want to read for people from Psalm 104. Sure. This is one of my favorite ones. Mine too. And, and it took my breath away when I first read it. And, and, I, and it happened to be the week I was preparing a lesson in my Sunday school. And so I was mm -hmm. able to, to take it to the congregation. It says, Bless, O my being, the Lord. Lord my God, you are very great. Grandeur and glory you don. Wrapped in light like a cloak. Stretching out heavens like a tent cloth setting beams for his lofts in the waters, making his chariot the clouds. He goes on the wings of the wind. And it goes on this way. And in your commentary, you talk about how it's drawing this beautiful image of God donning this clothing of grandeur and glory and that becomes the stars itself as though as though you can look up and see God's cloak right, right. over the earth. It's a beautiful image. It is. And uh, since you've read those lines, uh, l let me make a remark about one other translation. To Grandeur and glory you don. Which I really like the sound of that. And, uh, of course, there's a strong alliteration in grandeur and glory. And the Hebrew is hod vahadar lavashta. So you, it's almost the same rhythm. And you have the a similar alliteration. When I read the Hebrew and I feel the magnificent role of sound mm. in the language, I, I thought I have to try to do that in English as well. Yeah, there's so much more going on in the Hebrew. This is yeah. the value of your translations is finding those things that are happening in the Hebrew that have been lost in English translations from the beginning, that, that have never been accessible in English translations. We're talking today with Robert Alter. He's professor of Hebrew and comparative literature at UC Berkeley. We're talking about his translation of the Hebrew Bible. He's written other books like The Art of Bible Translation, The Art of Biblical Poetry, The Art of Biblical Narrative, and has published all sorts of excellent things on the Bible. Uh, Robert, before we go, I wanted to know how your own feelings about the Bible may have changed over the course of translating it. Mm -hmm. You worked on it for maybe a quarter of a century. Almost, yeah. Yeah, so how did your relationship to the Bible change? Well, I would begin by saying this, that, that of course th there are things in the Bible that are hard to fit into our value system. That is, uh, we don't particularly like the, these episodes uh, of thousands of Israelites being swallowed up or cut down by the sword because they've exhibited rebellious behavior. We don't go in for stoning much these days. Uh, our culture does, some mm -hmm. others do. So in grappling with the whole Bible, I realized that, of course, th th there are some things that I would say that they're ju just not part of my values that I, nothing I can accept. Uh, also, the, there are things in the Bible where the, there are counter voices, and I identify with the counter voice. For, for example, there was a, a polemic among the returnees from exile to the kingdom of Judah about whether to accept people who were not of pure Israelite extraction. And Ezra and Nehemiah took a very uncompromising view that we have nothing to do with these people. Not only do we have nothing to do with them, but those of you who have taken foreign wives 
You have to kick them out, which is a very cruel thing. Now, I'm afraid that became the majority opinion in, in posterity. But there is a counter view, and that's the Book of Ruth, probably written at the same time. And in the Book of Ruth, a Moabite woman, and the Moabites are supposed to be sworn enemies of Israel and never to come into the sanctuary. A Moabite woman is this devoted, loving person who says, wherever you go, I will go and so forth. Your God is my God. And who becomes the progenitrix of King David. And so I identify with that, but not with, with the opposing mm. view. But I, I would say this, that, that overall, I um, came to a fuller appreciation that there's so much in the Bible that speaks to our lives, to our understanding of people and of human predicaments. Now, it's, it's not a matter of straightforward moral instruction. That is, the, the Bible, at a, except for a few places, is not a didactic book, but it does convey a very complex notion of what human beings are all about. And, and that's really an enriching thing mm. to continue to follow. Mm. Thank you. Last question here. What would you say has been the most satisfying part of your work to this point in your career? What have you found the most personal satisfaction in? A, a part of the work or a book? Anything from your whole career, whether it be teaching a class or oh, I someone see. you met with or just anything. Oh, you know. I see. Well, I wouldn't compare it to teaching a class. I love teaching and um, I'm gratified, seriously gratified by my teaching successes, and um, every once in a while in Berkeley, say, I'll meet a guy uh, on the tennis court uh, <laughs> a, decade, a couple of decades younger than I, and we'll hit balls together. And then he'll say, say, you're a UC professor, aren't you? And I'll say, yeah. <laughs> and then he'll say, you know, I took your course on the Bible 25 years ago, and that was really a great course. <laughs> that feels wonderful. But it's just a different order of gratification from the gratification of producing a translation of the Bible. Just as you, you would say, that certainly there's nothing more gratifying that, than a profound love relationship. But it's not the same. Each thing is different in its own way. So if I think of the kinds of things or texts that gave me great gratification in translating the, the Bible, I would say, well, in general, in the narratives, uh, once I had hit my stride, having worked out a style that I thought conveyed the strength, the eloquence, the punchiness of the Hebrew. And in translating the poetry, being able to reproduce something that actually sounded a lot more in its rhythmic force and compactness like the Hebrew, and uh, that conveyed some of the poetic strengths of the Hebrew. And, and I'll, I'll mention just two examples. I said before that I, I think the voice from the world when is one of the, the great peaks of ancient poetry. So when I s sat before that Hebrew text, I said, I got to do something good with this. <laughs> and I felt that I did that there, there weren't very many painful compromises and, and that the grandeur and the sweep and the vividness of the poetry spoken out of the world when came across to a large extent in my English version. So that was really satisfying. Then uh, another biblical text, which we haven't mentioned, the Song of Songs. 
which is certainly one of the most w- wonderful pieces of love poetry of all times. And it's richly sensual at the same time that there's a certain delicacy about it. That, that's a balance that's hard to strike. I, I think that by and large, I was able to do that, and that felt very good. Mm. Good. That's Robert Alter. He's professor of Hebrew and comparative literature at the University of California, Berkeley. And he recently published a translation of the Hebrew Bible. I believe it's the first complete English translation by a single translator. Is that right? There, I think the publisher been, told me that. So yeah, blame them. I, I think that's sort of true. <laughs> I, I think th- there have been some eccentric translations. Uh, some of them have a certain interest, but but they're um, but by a single yeah by a single person. Oh. But they oh, I guess the message would be one of those. Yeah, right? the message the is one. Of, see, okay. the message Pastor Peterson got a message from God that he had to translate yeah. the Bible, both testaments, and he, I don't know to what extent he actually knows the, either biblical Hebrew. Yeah, he might have just used uh, or, you know, regular versions and English versions. Uh, it's kind of inventive in um, using colloquial American to translate biblical phrases like give us this day our daily bread becomes provide us three square meals. Yeah. Or you didn't consult that one on your translation. (laughs) No, no. Or or (laughs) the one I really (laughs) like is and the Lord said to all the growing things green up. Yeah. So it has a kind of liveliness, but yeah. it, it, it's it's playing a different ball game with different right. rules. Uh, yeah, and it's for a different purpose. So, yeah, yeah, sure. So it, it may speak to a certain kind of parishioner, but I, I don't quite consider it a serious translation of the yeah, Bible. Yeah. So I go along with my publisher. That's right. And and if folks can't get the entire Hebrew Bible, which is published in a box set, they can also check out individual volumes. I highly recommend Genesis. That's a great place to start. It comes in a single paperback, really inexpensive volume. Robert also recently published a short book called The Art of Bible Translation. Uh, This is from Princeton University Press, a fantastic book that goes over all the little elements of style that go into a translation, such as diction, rhythm, syntax, vocabulary, dialogue, and all of these things. So Uh, If you're interested in that, you can pick up these books. And again, Robert, we really appreciate you taking the time to visit Brigham Young University. Well, I've enjoyed your questions. Thank you. Another episode is in the books. Before we go, we have a nice little review of the show from Jacqueline Sokol, who says, this is so great. Thank you to the team that puts these together. This podcast is so very needed. Well, thank you for the five stars, Jacqueline, a longtime friend of the Institute. And I want to see more reviews, friends. If you're using Apple Podcasts, just go into your app, search for the show in your search option, click on the show and the results. You'll have to scroll down a little bit and then you'll see a place where you can write a review there. We'll talk to you next time on the Maxwell Institute podcast.